I want to explain, well, springs in general, what is a shock, how does it work, uh, and sway bars, and how those all contribute to overall suspension and how it functions. So the first and most important thing to under understand about a suspension is there's a spring and there's a shock. Now, what does a spring do? A spring actually just does that. It suspends the weight, in this case a vehicle, above the unsprung weight, which in this case would be axles and tires and these kinds of things. And so when you hit a bump, the bump is going to force the tire, the wheel tire, axle, everything up. The spring is gonna soak that up. Now the problem with springs, they're bouncy, hence the term springs. And maybe you've seen this, a good example of a car without a shock that just springs is when a shock is totally worn out. You ever seen a hoopty rolling down the road? It's like an old car, it's like you know, 20, 30 years old and it's been poorly maintained and it goes over a bump on the freeway and you just think the thing going like wallowing like this. You can actually text, test this. If you push on the corner of a car, it should do a bounce and return to normal. It should not do bounce, bounce, bounce. And what's gonna return to normal is a shock. So in here, is a Falcon adjustable remote reservoir shock, or piggyback, excuse me. And then this is a leaf spring. You're also probably familiar with in cars, they have a coil spring. Both are springs, both, um, they have advantages and disadvantages, but both uh, essentially do the same thing, which is uh, put the car, uh, uh, suspend the weight of the van above the axles and the tires. Now, the shock on the other hand, is actually not contributing to um, kind of the, the spring rate of the vehicle, what the shock's doing is actually uh, kind of counteracting the spring in some sense. So if a spring is springy, if you go over a bump, it would spring up and then it would bounce like this. And if you get on a washboard road, it would go brrrr, and the wheel would actually come uh, off contact with the ground fairly frequently. That's a very bad thing. How does a shock work? So the way a shock works is essentially uh, the best explanation that I have for a shock is like a French press. Have you ever seen a French press for coffee? You've got like a big jar of coffee, you've got the coffee grounds and a filter and a big plunger, and you push down on the plunger and the, it forces um, the uh, plunger through the water and it forces the water through the coffee gr uh, grounds. And when you get to the bottom, you've got coffee on top. Now, we're not making coffee. You've got shock fluid, kind of a hydraulic like fluid inside of the shock. And the way a shock works is, it's got discs in it, just like a French press with a plunger. When you go over a bump and it compresses a spring, the same thing happens to the shock. The shock comes down, it compresses, and there's a piston. That piston goes, uh, has a, a disc on the top and that disc has holes on it. Now I'm oversimplifying it, but bear with me. The size of those holes determine how quickly the fluid can move through it. So uh, you can make a stock shiffer, uh, stiffer or softer depending on how big those holes are. And so uh, the spring compresses and the piston moves up and the fluid is forced through that hole and that's the resistance on the shock. So a tiny hole is going to allow, uh, make it harder for the fluid to move through as the shock is compressed. That is a firmer shock. If you have a wider hole, the fluid moves through more easily. That is a softer shock. Now the cool thing about the Van Compass uh, kit with the Falcons is it's adjustable. How is that working? Well, again, oversimplification, but imagine instead of a single disc with a hole in it, you've now got two discs with a hole in it. And by twisting those, adjusting the clickers, the holes can be in line, basically open, allow a lot of fluid to travel through, or by twisting them, the two holes will go from completely in line to slightly off center, making that center channel smaller. It's a firmer ride. When you're on the street, on a freeway, on the road, you're gonna to wanna to shock on the firmer setting. That's because the bumps and the uh, deformation of the road surface on a paved road is gonna be much less than it is off-road. That's gonna allow the whole vehicle to feel more stable, and so you're gonna want a firmer ride on road. That is the opposite of what you want on uh, dirt or off-road. You actually want the shock to be a little bit softer to allow more movement, it's gonna be less jarring, and it's gonna allow uh, the tire to stay in contact with the surface, which is what you want for traction, uh, much better than a firmer setting. So that's why it's nice to have this clicker because for uh, road going, firm, number, uh, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, I'm gonna look after. Uh, number three is firm, number one is soft. I'll correct it if I'm wrong here on the bottom of the video. I'm gonna feel really stupid if I'm wrong. Um, it allows you to switch between them and that's one of my favorite things. The piggyback reservoir. So most shocks that you see are a single cylinder. Why does the Van Compass have an extra cylinder on the back, the piggyback? That's because, imagine 
this shock is moving up and down really quickly. You're on a washboard road and that, that uh, piston is moving up and down really frequently. And what all of that movement is gonna heat up the fluid inside of that shock. The warmer a fluid is, the more viscous, I think I have that right. Um, basically, the fluid moves more easily as it heats up, which means the shock becomes less effective. What we've done, or not we, but what Van Compass has done here with the piggyback shock is massively increase the volume of fluid. The example would be, imagine if the radiator in your car only had like half a gallon of water and it ran through the system really fast. It couldn't carry much heat out of the engine. Same thing is true of the fluid inside of a shock. When you have a small single piston shock, there's not much room for fluid, which means that fluid can easily heat up, especially imagine on a washboard road where the tires going like this, or you're going bump, 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 bump. That fluid is constantly moving in and out of that shock. It's going to heat up fairly quickly. With the piggyback, you're going to dramatically, or I should say drastically, increase the amount of fluid that you have, which is going to keep the fluid temperature down, which is going to allow the shock to operate uh, more effectively longer. So that for me, um, hands down, is one of the nicest components of the Falcon setup uh, on the Van Compass suspension is the fact that you go from um, some of the other kits on the market with a single shock to a piggyback shock that best of all is adjustable. So you get the best of both worlds. A fantastic on-road uh, capabilities and fantastic off-road capabilities. Now, let's talk about springs. We mentioned what they do earlier. They are kind of the most critical component to start with of a suspension. If a vehicle is not, does not have the proper spring rate or the proper, we'll call it sag, Many uh, mountain bikers may have understood or may have heard the term sag before. Um, basically, when you jack a van up into the air, the tire is going to drop and the spring is going to extend slightly and then you lower it onto the wheels and the van is going to, with its own weight, create a certain amount of compression of that spring. A stock sprinter that you buy off of the showroom floor is empty and Mercedes-Benz are not morons. They know what they're doing. They design the spring pack for or the rear uh, leaf springs in a Mercedes to be the right, right or correct spring rate for a fairly empty van. Why would they do this when they know the van's going to be loaded? Well, because they sell the van when it's empty. They don't sell it when it's fully loaded. And no dealership in the world is going to load a van up with um, you know, a ton of bricks while you test drive it. And if you have an oversprung vehicle, it's going to be very bouncy, very twitchy, very nervous. They don't want people to show up to a Mercedes dealership, test drive an empty cargo van and be like, this thing handles like garbage. So what do they do? They make it sprung for an empty van. It makes it handle great on the test drive, but the moment you put stuff in it, it collapses the spring, it handles like crap. This spring, when a Revel is built out, the Revel I think approaches 9, 9,500 pounds with water when it's built out, overloads the spring. What happens is the spring starts to collapse, you get onto the bump stops. The bump stops are not uh, while they're part of your suspension, they are not supposed to be your only suspension. They are a fail-safe. They are stopping the axle and metal from coming into contact with the rest of the unibody. And when you don't add spring rate to the rear of the van with a suspension upgrade, you essentially have your vehicle riding on the bump stops. This is why you get that, I call it the rock shaker. You drive out of a driveway or you hit a bump and the whole van goes like this. It's because you're not able to soak up those initial bumps effectively. When you've got that collapsed spring, you have a lack of travel in the suspension. So it's worse at soaking up those bumps, especially off-road. So that right there, um, to answer people's question, why can't I just replace the shocks? That's a lot cheaper. Yes, better shocks helps, but if you don't have the right spring rate, you've got a critical problem with the suspension right from the start. So the most important thing to do to a van that's built out, if the rear leafs are collapsed, is you need to replace or add uh, spring rate to those springs to get the van at the correct ride height and get the spring functioning properly. Once you've done that, adding shocks to me is a no-brainer. Uh, the expense versus what you get, absolutely worth it. So what does a sway bar do? Sway bar in a vehicle that goes on the road and off-road is a little bit of a more complicated situation because a sway bar on the road, fantastic. A sway bar off-road, exactly what you don't want. Uh, don't want. A sway bar is what allows a car to, uh, to corner very flat. If you've ever seen old cop movies and um, you see like an old 70s sedan going around a corner and the thing is listing really hard to the outside, the front wheel's almost coming off the ground, what's happening there 
is as you corner, the weight is rolling to the outside of the vehicle, which is causing it to lift up the inside of the suspension, which is causing the suspension to narrow as it travels through the arc, which is causing the vehicle to get higher, which is causing it to roll more. And it's a, a horrible compounding event that makes a vehicle handle like crap. Uh, earlier, I mentioned as well, that sway bars can help something handle in the wind. Well, it's the same thing. A cornering is a side load on the vehicle. Wind can be a side load on the vehicle, causing it to tilt and all the uh, aforementioned uh, problems that causes. How does a sway bar function? A sway bar is essentially, think of it like a giant overbuilt paperclip. It is shaped uh, mostly like a large U and what it does is it connects this side of the vehicle with a bar that runs across the vehicle and connects it to the other side. It's that simple. So think about this now. That bar is attached at the front near the wheels and then it's also attached to the body at another part uh, of the bar. And so what happens is that bar, as the van starts to roll and one side wants to pick up, the other side actually holds it down because the other side is pushing that bar down. So as this one tries to pick up, the other side gets pushed down, that bar holds that side down. So instead of the car, when the 70s cops show rolling like this, the car actually can slide now, but it doesn't roll. The sway bar keeps the car nice and flat and level through the corner. The same is true of a Mercedes Sprinter. When you're on the road, you want a nice beefy sway bar. It's gonna keep all that high center of gravity from rotating around when you corner, it's gonna keep the van flat. It's a very, very effective piece of suspension. And that's why someone might say, hey, one of my friends got great results by putting a larger sway bar on their van. They very well may have, but they won't get great results off-road, and here is why. A lot of companies, I think Van Compass included, offer sway bar disconnects when you go off-road. This is because you now need the opposite of what you need on-road. You need these wheels to operate independently because you're not trying to stop body roll. You don't corner fast when you're off-road. You're trying to allow suspension articulation. That means you're trying to allow the wheel to go up and down as much as possible because you want to leave as many wheels on the ground when you're off-roading as possible because you can't get traction out of a wheel that's not on the ground. So by beefing up your sway bar for on-road capabilities, unless you also install a quick disconnect, you have now actually made your vehicle worse off-road. So there's the trade-off, <coughs> excuse me, of adding a larger sway bar. I'm not against it. I love big fat sway bars, but I love them for on-road. In race cars, one of the first things you do is put a nice big sway bar on there, and uh, it really helps the car corner flat. So again, I just want to touch on, you have springs, shocks, and sway bars, and on a sprinter, the biggest problem is the spring, right? Next is the shock itself. You're gonna to wanna to upgrade the shock. And then sway bars are really up to you. If you want your van to corner better and are mostly uh, doing all of your driving on the road, a larger sway bar might be a really good investment. If you wanna do both on-road and off-road, then definitely look at a quick disconnect because <clears throat> you're gonna want that suspension to articulate and move independently when uh, you're off-road. So hopefully, <laughs> I didn't just uh, talk your ear off for 15 minutes and explain things that don't make sense. Hopefully I tried to make it very understandable. But when I talk about things like updating the suspension and why it's so important on a vehicle and people comment, well, Mercedes engineers are no dummies. Why wouldn't they do this? Well, correct. Not only are Mercedes engineers no dummies, but the sales department's no dummies either. And if a vehicle handles like garbage at the dealership, you can't sell it. And while Mercedes might have a high gross vehicle weight rating, for their Sprinter, it doesn't mean that's the optimum performance of that suspension. So if you put a few thousand pounds in a Sprinter van, will it collapse and fall over? Not at all. This van's built out. It has a few thousand pounds of, of stuff in it. Does it handle well? Does it perform well? Is the suspension set where it's supposed to be as far as spring rate and its operating potential? Absolutely not. So that is why you can buy a van off the showroom floor with suspension that doesn't necessarily work or is not optimized for the job that we're asking it to do. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense. I'll stop talking now. You've probably heard my voice enough. Uh, hopefully that helps you understand suspension. Thank you so much for listening. 